open your Bibles. Uh, it'll be a minute before we get there, but go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Um, but some of the passages that we're going to look at today, y'all have heard me hit before. I know you've heard David hit them before, uh, but I think we're going to talk about something just a tad bit different. And so hopefully it'll be helpful and beneficial the Lord will use it so if you want to if you're one that writes down titles of sermons or anything like that I this one's titled the testimony of creation so if you want to write that down I'm normally not big on sermon titles but go ahead and write that down if you are <laughs> so there's a lot of times uh, in our lives that we we tend to lose sight of the supernatural nature of the world around us you know we've we've become so accustomed to uh, modern scientific thought, not that there's anything wrong with, with seeing the world in that way and understanding why things work the way they do from you know, mathematics and physics and chemistry and, and knowing all those things and seeing how they work because if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the jobs that we go to every single day, right? I mean, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to make a tube at work if they didn't know the physics and the geometry and all that to make it work. So it's helpful to know those things. It helps us to do what the Lord has called us to do in, in taking dominion over the creation that he's given us. So th that, that is a good way to see things. But uh, oftentimes in, in our human nature, we tend to uh, chase one way of thinking at the expense of another way of thinking. 
So you've, you've heard the saying, you know, when you fall off a horse and you get back on and fall off the other side, or instead of running into this ditch, now you've got it back on the road and then you ran it into the other ditch. That, that tends to be what we do all throughout history. I mean, you can read the history of ideas and things like that and just see how mankind goes off this ditch and then it steers back and then we go off of that ditch, just back and forth. So I think one of the ditches that we've fallen into is that as we've grown to know more about the creation around us and how we can measure things and, and know exactly how molecules work and all of that, we've fallen off completely the side of seeing that God is the creator and that there is a supernatural essence to the world that we live in. So that's, that's kind of what I want to hit on a little bit today. Uh, it's kind of the backdrop for what we're going to talk about. So we've, we've forgotten a lot of the symbolic nature of God's creation, of how you can look at the things that he's created, and there's a certain amount of symbolism to teach us certain things. I'm trying to build a backdrop for what I'm going into, so if that makes sense a little bit, just nod your head, yes, yeah, so I keep going. <laughs> there's a certain amount of symbolism in that. Uh, God has implanted stories and testimonies all over his creation, and we live among these stories every single day, and we, we see them played out. Uh, a lot of our problem is that we've been so blinded by sin and, and sometimes blinded by our way of thinking that I talked about earlier of going into another ditch that we miss these things on a daily basis. It's like you're having these stories played out in front of you, but you miss them on a daily basis while you're just riding to work or while you're whatever it is you're doing. We, we miss them. And, you know, often we are oblivious to these stories and, and we forget the testimony that God is trying to show us on a daily basis and we miss opportunities to worship Him. And we also miss opportunities to show other people these stories and use that as a way to share the gospel with them. So these, these are ways that, that have, have challenged our thinking, have, have gotten us off track. Uh, I want to bring all this back around and I want to take one doctrine, one teaching from Scripture and see how God has implanted that truth that, that we learn from Scripture all across His creation. So obviously I'm not going to be able to hit every single example of this because I mean, it's, it's almost endless. We can't exhaust that today. But what we're going to look at is the doctrine of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at His death, His burial, and His resurrection and see how because this is like the focal point of history that you know, God has made this event. I mean, even, you know, even our forefathers of the faith have seen how this is the pivotal point in history, and we've even changed how we make dates according to this that happened. Obviously, it's not an exact time, but because of who Jesus was and his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, like, you know, we, we stopped counting down. You know, that, that's how we mark time, right? So we've completely changed that based on this event. So I'd say it's a pretty important event, right? I mean, we kind of wouldn't be here Christians if it didn't happen. So... Uh, this is a very big doctrine that we have from Scripture, and this is something I want to focus on today. So how has God implanted this, the very concept of the resurrection within creation? How can we see this on a regular day-to-day -day basis? So now we're going to hit our Scripture to kind of give us the, the foundation for all of this. So if you're in Romans chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 19 through 21. Normally we would read the whole passage of this, but I'm just going to read verses 19 through 21. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So, if that's... I feel like that's an exact summary of what we were talking about earlier. You know, we, we saw that there was a helpful way of thinking that we pursued, and then we pursued it so far that we forgot that there was a God behind it all, and we just rejected that. And so he gave us over to feudal thinking, and now we don't even see the wonderful testimonies that he gives us in his creation to who he is and to what he has done. So that's, that's one set of verses. And then the other one is Psalm 19, which is one that should be pretty familiar. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. 
There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. So let's pray before we go any further. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you reveal to us through your word, through this special revelation that you've given to us, that we can know your, your will, that we can know what you, who you are and what you have done for us according to this word, that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is authoritative and that we can trust it and it is the truth. And Lord, we also thank you for your revelation that you reveal to us through what you have made, through the, the nature and the world that, that we live in, uh, that we can, we can see that, we can see who you are and see some of the things that you have done uh, through that. And you teach us so many things through that, Lord. And I pray that today that we can kind of see an understanding of that, uh, that you would help us to learn uh, how to look to your creation, to, to give testimony to the things that we learn in Scripture, Lord, uh, as, a, as a dual witness, Lord. So I pray that as we continue today that uh, you would just give us understanding uh, and that you would just bless this time that we have together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So whenever we read these verses, the verses from Romans and the verse in Psalm 19, a lot of, and I've, I've been guilty of this as well, but a lot of times we tend to limit our thinking to just the grandeur of creation, right? The idea of you know, going to the Grand Canyon and seeing just how great that is. So you know, we say, well, God is just great because this is great and he created this. So you know, that's, a lot of times we'll limit our thinking to that or we'll see a beautiful sunrise and it's like God must be beautiful because he created this beautiful sunrise. And we tend to just limit it to things like that, which isn't bad. That's right. You know, seeing those things and making those connections is right and good and biblical. But we tend to just limit it to that rather than seeing you know, the, the things that God has actually done, which we see in Scripture, and see how that's played out in creation as well. So a lot of times that's just an oversimplification of seeing what God does through creation, just seeing that, that grandeur, the vastness, or the beauty of creation. Uh, but the world around us bears witness to scriptural truth as well, uh, to, to the different things that we see. And, and what we're going to see today is that it bears witness to the resurrection as well. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the resurrection? And that might sound like a simple question, like obviously we know that. But let's just look at 1 Corinthians 15 so that we can get a biblical definition of the resurrection. This is just two verses. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. Uh, chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Uh, this is Paul speaking. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So when we're talking about the event of the resurrection, you can't have a resurrection without a death, right? So when we're talking about this event, we're talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if you want to add ascension on top of that, that's like a whole complete package. Like that's, that's the biggest event in history is Christ's death, burial, resurrection, ascension. All of that in you know, those matter of days, really. So that's, that is what we mean by the resurrection. So what are the basic components of that? We've already mentioned them. You have a death, you have a burial, you have a resurrection, and then you have a result. So if you want to write those down, those will probably be good to write down because that's the connection we're going to see all throughout these examples I'm going to use. So death, burial, resurrection, and result. The result's kind of a word that could run around. You could use fruit, you could use harvest, you could use... Whatever you want to use for that, the, the, the idea behind it is the result of everything that happened before. So death, burial, resurrection, result. So if those are the basic components of the resurrection, and that's what Scripture teaches us, and we hold Scripture to be authoritative, and that's the absolute truth, we know that this has happened, then how do we now look not only to the rest of Scripture, but to the world around us to see how that bears witness to the truth of the resurrection? And we're going to see a few examples of that. So first... I want to see where else do we see this in Scripture? Where else do we see the idea of a death, a burial, a resurrection, and the result? So if y'all are familiar with, you know, if you're watching a TV show and you see there's like multiple seasons, like a lot of seasons, sometimes when you get to later seasons, they'll bring something back that you, from like the first two or three seasons, or maybe the first season that they haven't even touched since then. And a lot of times they call that a, a callback, something along those lines. So when you're watching it, you're like, so that's how it all connects, or that's how it happened. And it's a good feeling, right? It's like you cracked a case. So that's, 
that's kind of what we're going to hit to start off with. So y'all know I always like to go back to Genesis 1 through 3, right? So go to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to see how from the very beginning you have a death, a burial, a resurrection, and a result that's already pointing forward to what Christ is going to do. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and look at verses 20 through 23. So if we're familiar with the context, you know, you've got God creating all of creation in chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. And then it kind of zooms in to talk about how he created Adam and how Adam was to name all of these creatures. And you know, Adam was supposed to have dominion over the earth and he was you know, supposed to be worshiping God in this garden. All of these things that we're mentioning. But then God saw that it was not good that man should be alone. So that's when he brings the animals for him to name the animals. And it's like, well, the animal's not going to cut it. He needs, ultimately we know the answer, he needs a wife, right? So verses 20 through 23, let's read this. And see if you see the connection to death, burial, resurrection, result. All right, verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with, fre uh, with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now we're supposed to assume that the man has woken up at this point if he's talking, right? So there's an awakening from a deep sleep. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we've got a man who's being put in a deep sleep. And if you, the Hebrew, you know how you read the Old Testament, it talks about he fell asleep. And what they mean by that is he died. I mean, we see that time and time again. So you've got a man who's falling into a deep sleep. It emphasizes that deep sleep. Something's being done to him while he's in that deep sleep. Now he's being brought back up. And what does he see? She's a woman, right? How does that point forward to the resurrection? Christ dies while he's buried. There's some stuff going on. <laughs> he's resurrected. And what is the result of his death, burial, and resurrection? The church, is it not? The body of believers that came about as a result of what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. So we already see that there's more than just this idea of Jesus dying or being buried, resurrected, and the result. But we see this scattered all throughout Scripture, that there's little sprinkles everywhere that testify to the truth of the resurrection. So as you're reading your Bible, you, know, you can't read Genesis 2 and say, well, we ain't got the gospel yet. We ain't got to the gospel yet. It's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's testified to everywhere. So what's another example of this? I don't have a specific Scripture reference because you'd have to read the whole Old Testament. But just look at Israel's history. You have t multiple over and over and over again where there's a, it's, it's almost like God brings them down to this small remnant, this small believing number, and they think this is the death of Israel. Like we've, we've come all the way down to the wire, and there's only a handful of us left. Think about Elijah. Elijah thought he was, I'm the only one left. You know, who's going to serve you now? I mean, if that's not the idea of separation and death, then I don't know what is. But, you know, the Lord says, I have my remnant. There is hope. There's 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee uh, to Baal. And so you have this idea of a death, and then the Lord does a work. There's some, there's some righteous kings that you actually start to see that work, but then there's a greater work in the exile when they come back and they rebuild the temple, and you see this idea of a resurrection and a, and a, a fruit and a result. The ultimate result is the coming of the Messiah through them, right? So constantly through Israel's history, you see a death, a burial, a resurrection, and the fruit of it. Even in their time in captivity in Egypt, you see the same thing. This, over and over again, this is played through. And you can go to you know, stories, individual stories, where you see that. But like I said, we don't have time to go through all of that. What's one more example? You heard this last week, but we'll go back over it again. Romans chapter 6. So that was the last one. Was, you, know, you had two Old Testament examples. Now we're going to look at the New Testament. How even after the resurrection, you still have a testimony to the resurrection. So Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 1 through 11. So what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. So think about this being like the fruit. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So there's your death. 
We're, as believers, we are supposed to have died to sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, there's your burial, baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. There's the burial and the death part. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There's your result. That's the result of the death, the burial, the resurrection. The result should be newness of life. So not only do we have just this general idea of we're saved because Christ died, was buried, and was resurrected, and that's the end of the story, but the very nature of our salvation is a death, a burial, a resurrection. Y'all see how all these things are being tied together around this pivotal event in history? And so now, you, whenever you have that way of thinking, you can almost laugh at somebody who wants to call into question whether the resurrection happened or not. You see how that's just a ridiculous argument to even have whenever the very foundation of your newness of life, you're already living in the result. So there's no question that the resurrection happened or you wouldn't be living the way you are. I mean, you don't, you don't even have to think in a concept of let me go through all the historical evidence and see who's testified to this. No, you're living the proof. You are the proof. I mean, that's just the way that you're walking and living. And the entirety of the Bible Stuff that was written thousands of years before the resurrection even happened was already testifying to a death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, you're standing on solid ground, right? You're not on anything shaky. So that's, that's what we see throughout Scripture. And like I said, there's so many more examples for this. I challenge you, if you do like a, a, a yearly Bible reading plan type thing, just start looking for where do I see a death, a burial, a resurrection, and you know, a result in these stories. You know, a lot of times we call them little Bible stories, but they are teaching powerful truths through those stories, right? So I challenge you to do that. Look for that because it's almost like God uses that as an organizing theme. And we do it in our lives too, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. So where else do we see this in creation? This is kind of the main point I was going to hit on is, is where do we see this out in the world? We saw that the Bible teaches that Jesus died, buried, resurrected, result. We see all throughout Scripture that there's multiple examples of this tying it all together. So how do we now take that truth that we know to be true out and see it played out every day in creation? So these are some examples, and I'm sure y'all could probably come up with more. These are just the ones that, that I thought through. You ever thought about day and night cycles? Every night, sun goes down, right? You have a setting of the sun. The day's over. You're not going to get any work done unless you work third shift. I don't think it's very godly, but, <laughs> but you work third shift, you know, you might be working. But, you know, the sun goes down, work day's over, right? There's a sleep. We sleep at night. We were made to sleep at night. There's no, you know, it's not a coincidence that the, the symbolism for dying, you know, the sleep happens at night when the sun goes down. So there's a burial of the sun. Obviously, we know the earth rotates, right? We know all of our scientific way of thinking about things. But as far as our view from here, the sun sets, right? And then in the morning, you have this rising of the sun. And what's the result? Work can be done, right? There's, there's things that be done. You can go out and walk and do things and, and, and get your hands dirty and do work. And then at the end of the day, you've got it all over again. The sun's buried. There's a, there's a death. There's, there's night. Go to sleep again. New day. Brand new work to do. God is reminding us of a death, a burial, a resurrection every single night and every single morning when we go to sleep and when we wake up. And it's all by His grace, is it not? Do you wake up in the morning apart from His grace? No. Do you do anything throughout the day apart from His grace? No. So when it comes to our salvation, are we saved apart from His grace? Can we do good works apart from His grace? No. So every single day, instead of just saying, well, the sun's going down, that means that the earth has rotated blah, blah, blah miles. And yeah, you could talk about that. If you're a scientist, that might help you make certain decisions and things like that. But as a believer and as somebody who knows that this world has a creator, you know that that is a testimony of God's saving grace. Just by looking at the sun go down and the sun come up. That's a testimony. That's an opportunity for you to worship, an opportunity for you to teach your kids, for you to teach a coworker, whatever it is. So those are opportunities. What's another example? Uh, this is one that's actually used in Scripture talking about Jesus in the Gospels, but planting seed. I mean, you know, whenever you plant a seed, that seed has to die in the ground, right? It has to die and be buried. 
and then new life comes from that. It, it comes out, when, you know, whenever that plant sprouts up, that's like a resurrection of a, of a dead plant, right? Because that's where you got the seed from, was a plant that has died, and now you take that seed and you bury it, and now there's new fruit that comes from it. Is that not, once again, a testimony of what Christ has done for us? Does the Bible not you know, use our good works and calls it the fruit of the Spirit? Almost like it was meant to be like that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what it's using. What's another example? Whenever a forest burns, you see forest fires, right? And it, it, it just seems to completely decimate the landscape. There's just, everything is burned down. But you give it five years, and what's there afterwards? You got all this new life that's almost growing better than it was before because, you know, all the nutrients from the stuff that burned off has helped it grow. You've got all these examples. So, you know, you look on TV, and you see that there's this, there's this wildfire going again. You know, you can have the temptation to, one, you should pray for those people. Though You could have the temptation to say, what are we ever going to do? They always have wildfires. But then you could also worship because you know the Lord's going to bring about new life through that as well. So there's you another opportunity. What about the progression of the seasons? I mean, you're seeing that. I mean, we're you know, in fall right now. You're seeing all the leaves fall off the tree. They're in the process of going in a, a dormant state, right? You got that deep sleep all over again. And then whenever springtime rolls around, now you've got all this life bursting forth. And you've got fruit that is starting to come. All of these things, you see the same process of death, burial, resurrection, result. And if you didn't have that cycle, you wouldn't see the results, right? I don't see fruit growing on pine trees, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Y'all Yo, prove me wrong. <laughs> All right, well, what about, what about physical exercise? That's death. death. Well, I mean, <laughs> whenever, whenever somebody works out and they're doing, they're, they are literally destroying a, a muscle cell so that it'll build back stronger, right? It might not be a complete death for that cell, but it is destroying it so that whenever it grows back, it knows to grow back stronger. So every time you go and you push yourself to a limb, especially for athletes and things like that, when they're trying to make you stronger, you're being pushed to the, you're, you're at least pushing your cells to the point of death. You might, you might feel like you're dying too, but you know, you're pushing your cells to that point of death so that there can be a burial, which is you stopping doing that and resting and eating and sleeping so that it'll resurrect. And then whenever, you, what's the result? You're stronger, you're faster, you got better lungs, all of that stuff. So there can only be the result if you go through the process of a death, a burial, and a resurrection, right? And maybe this next one's one we can all uh, relate with. What about plot lines for stories? I mean, how many of y'all want to read a plot line where nothing bad ever happens, and it's just, everything's just cruising, just hunky-dory all the time? Like, that's not a story, is it? No, a story has to have, all right, everything's kind of going along good, but then there's something that's off. And now once you start pursuing that thing that's off, it ends up getting just, just nosedives, and you get to the climax. This is usually like, if you've got a 10-episode series, episode 9, it's like everything's done went, you know. Yes, yeah, dead. You got death. You know, what's, how are they going to pull this out? How is this going to fix? How is this going to resolve? And then... The end of that episode nine, you're like, well, maybe there's this, but we don't know. You know, you have the disciples, when Jesus was dead, I'm sure they said, well, he said something about a resurrection, but, I mean, what's the chances of that happening, right? But then episode 10, boom, here it all happens. Everything pulls together, and everything works out, unless they're preparing for season two when they leave you with another cliffhanger, right? So, I mean, that's what you see. They, they pull all these things together, and why do they do that? Because we like it, right? It's almost like we were built to tell stories like that. God has wired us that way because that's how he tells stories. He told the story that way through Jesus Christ. And he's not a storyteller that stays in the fictional realm. He's a storyteller that creates and makes it. And we are living in it. And everything around us is that story, is that plot line. And we see it time and time again. That's why you're not happy with a show that doesn't follow that kind of plot line. And you get mad with it. And say, why are these creators like that? And it's probably because we have a lot of unbelieving creators in our realm of film and things like that. It might be something to think about. So, how do we see this now? How does this affect us now? How do we take all of that and apply it to our life right now? And 
what I want to, what I want to do is first and, first and foremost is what I mentioned before. Read through scripture and look for that template of death, burial, resurrection, result. Just look for that and see how the Lord has used that all throughout scripture. And also, like I said before, look at the creation around you. You find examples of what the Lord's doing. And it might not necessarily have to do with the resurrection. It might be something else that the Bible teaches. And you can see how the Lord's put that in creation as well. We could probably think of examples of that. So what about us in our historical situation right now? So we're going through a period where it seems as if the church has been brought very low, right? Does everybody agree with that? Does it seem like there's just this, this, I don't know, it's almost like we just seem defeated, like everything's going downhill, there's, there's nothing we can do, we're just, let's just wait for it all to end, right? I mean, what if your favorite character of a TV show acted like that? Would you watch it? Would you put a poster of that favorite character on a wall? No. I mean, why would you? They're not being the hero. They're not being the one who's, you know, the main character. They're not acting like a main character. They're acting like a side character who ends up going to the bad side later. Like, I mean, that's, that's just the truth. So we, in, in this period of time, it seems like Christ's enemies are having victory, like one time after another that there's, this enemy is progressing and that we're being just smaller and smaller. But God has a pattern of taking a small remnant of believers through a death, burial, and resurrection so that abundant fruit is produced. I mean, time and time again, we mentioned it with Israel in the Old Testament. I mean, down to this smallest of remnant, and then boom, there's an explosion. There's just there's this resurrection, there's this faithfulness, there's people who've decided that they, all else has been taken from them but their faith in the Lord. And out of that, the Lord does something amazing. He, he, just, he, he creates all of this fruit out of it. I mean, you think about Israel, I mean, they... They were at a point where they were under Roman, Roman control. Roman, you, know, you had a handful that wanted to just go to battle and just fight the whole Roman Empire. You know, they were the gung-ho guys that, got, that get you know, shot down in the first line. But you know, there's this idea of just they just wanted to overtake this oppressor that they had in their life. And the Lord had a different plan. He brought down this humble baby, Jesus Christ, to have the, the whole type that we're talking about, this, you know, this death, this burial, this resurrection, to bring about a promise that he made not only to Adam and Eve, but to Abraham to make a great people of him from all of these nations. And are we not the living fruit of that? Are we not the result of a death, not only of a, of a nation growing towards a death under an oppressor, but then an abundant growth and fruit that, come, that came about through this Messiah that's been promised that's, this pattern has been going on and on and on and on throughout the Old Testament leading up to him. And the result of his death, burial, and resurrection is just this explosion of, of fruit. I mean, we talk about Pentecost. I mean, how many people were saved that day? 3,000, just phew, right there, one day. And there's another day, I wasn't there like another 5,000. Another. I mean, it was just steady, just clipping along, growing and growing, that by the point of... You know, the, the end of that first century, I mean, it is all over the Roman Empire. I mean, that is crazy growth out of this death, burial, and resurrection. So if the Lord can do that then, if the Lord can do that all throughout the Old Testament with Israel, if the Lord can do that in each and every one of our lives, whenever he brings us to himself and causes us to go through a death, burial, and resurrection, then why can't he do something right now with us? And I'm not even talking about the church as a whole over the whole globe. I'm talking about Macedonia. I mean, have we not had a time where we thought we were, you know, riding the mountaintops and we thought everything was going good and great and it seems like we have kind of hit a low valley or a death recently? I mean, COVID was almost like they were just tapping the nails on the coffin, but it was reflective of something that had already been happening leading up. Am I wrong? I mean, it had been something that had been building. COVID was just the... The, the, the thing that exposed what was in people's hearts, right? So now we are, it seems like we are in the coffin right now, kind of buried and waiting on some sort of resurrection, something to just happen. We've been praying, we've been waiting, and we'd be foolish to not believe that the Lord could do it because he's done it time and time and time and time again. And so that is the challenge, is for us to be patient in waiting. And I want to read one last scripture, and that's Galatians from Galatians 6. 
If y'all want to turn there, I mean, this is a good one just to highlight to have marked if you don't. It's one that I have to preach to myself because I forget it. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. What is reaping? Is that not a harvest word? That's a result, right? We will reap if we do not give up. Because we're so strong? No, because the Lord is faithful to His promises. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we've already been told what to do whenever times get hard, whenever it seems like we're about to go through that death and that burial, because that's when you're most tempted to say, well, what does it all matter anyway, right? You know, if we're just losing and the enemy's going to win, then I might as well just live like them. Has that not run through your head a time or two? It's run through mine. So that's something that we should challenge ourselves with, is that do not grow weary of doing good, because it's through those small things that the Lord's doing in our life. We're, individually, He's resurrected us, and, and has, has us going out living for His glory. Those little things, even we, see, we think in the grand scope they're insignificant, the Lord uses that to create great results. If he had one person, I know this is, we're talking about Jesus Christ, God the Son in the flesh, but one man could die, be resurrected, and ascend, and it have this grand result of just all these people coming to him through salvation, then what if the entire church started walking according to this, not growing weary of doing good? Even whenever you've got oppressive forces that want to fine you and uh, jail you or kill you for doing good, but you don't grow weary of doing it because you're one with the main character. Your question should be, would the main character do this? Is this something you, whenever you're a kid, you grew up thinking like that, right? Your favorite story, your favorite movie, I want to be like Spider-Man. Would Spider-Man do this? Or would Superman do this? Would he act like that? And that, we use that as examples for you know, what you did or something. But now, you know, we're grown up, but sometimes we should be a little more childlike, right? Especially with our faith. And we should look to Christ and say, that's the hero of the story. I'm one with him. We are the body of Christ. How would Christ do it? You know, we always joke, what would Jesus do? But what would Jesus do? <laughs> and actually know what would Jesus do, not the, the hippie stuff that they come out with today of what Jesus would do, but... The real Jesus, what would he do? How would he love people? How would he correct people in their sin so that they do see it as love and that they come to him for salvation? That's, all of these things are tied up in all this, but we can't grow weary of doing that because God is preparing not only a resurrection at the end of time, but he's preparing a resurrection for us. I know that the Lord is about to do something here. I mean, I know it. I know that he's going to do it, and he's preparing each and every one of us for that. So let us not grow weary of doing good, but let us hold fast, because in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So let's pray. Father, I thank you once again for your word. Lord, you, you have been working on me all week. I have, throughout the week, I have not lived up to this, Lord, but you have convicted me all throughout this week and I'm thankful that you are the one who is powerful to change hearts, to change minds and to, to bring us to action. Uh, Lord, I pray that that if there's any rebellious heart or any sin, sinful heart, uh, any, any heart that's looking to turn from you, Lord, that you would kill that heart, that you would bury it and that you would resurrect it to new life and that you would make it to walk in that newness of life, Lord so that we can live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you for the work that you've done in Christ, that by grace we can have salvation, and that by grace we can walk in that newness, and that we can do these good works that you have prepared for us from before the foundation of the world, Lord, that you've prepared them. It's your will for us to walk in them, and you will have your way, Lord. And we pray that you would do that in us, that we'd have the opportunity to be blessed by being in that work and that you would receive all the glory for it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.